So how'd you go from moving moving stuff to teaching at NEC? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, anybody uh, listening to me talk knows that I, I, I can talk. And <laughs> sometimes I make sense. And so... Following again in the sort of uh, lead, the lead of my heroes, you know, people like Braxton and Wadada, um, Cecil, Ornett, um, I would say there's a, been a lot of need in my approach to this to be able to articulate what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And being on my own and not being part of a trained community of musicians, I often had to explain myself to musicians that would play with me in in I would say pretty pre, I had to I had to configure the way I explained myself. Sure. And yet I got good results from the musicians I played with. And none of them knew this this kind of thing. I played with an incredible bass player named Sebastian Steinberg who was maybe you know the most intuitive just like friend I ever played with. He mm -hmm. was a phenomenal bass player and uh Mark Harvey who ran um the the um, music at the church series introduced me to Sebastian and I hit it off. We hit it off. We were really good friends and we played a lot of stuff and I bring in pieces and we play them and I never really had to tell him anything. You know, he just played after that when he was gone, he went to New York and got busy and I couldn't play with him anymore. Um, I had people that would come and I have to explain the whole thing to them. Yeah. And some of them didn't like that I was explaining it to them. And some of them thought I should be able to explain it to them differently. But none of them knew what I wanted until I explained it to them. Sure. And I guess uh, from that, I learned to sort of write about it. And so I wrote some things about it. And I was interviewed quite a bit. And um, where did you, you write about it? Where, I, mean, I wrote liner notes about it. I wrote okay. I, I did a bunch of interviews. You know, during the during the 90s, I had a lot of press, a lot of press um, and I guess I got a reputation. Well, not only did I get a reputation for being, you know, hard headed and being very opinionated, I also got a reputation as somebody who could explain what I was what I was doing. Yeah. Um, coincidentally, I spoke to um, uh, some people about at a certain point. I said, "Well, you know, I, I think I need to teach because, um, you know, I, I couldn't do the the day job anymore." Mm -hmm. And um, one of them. Actually, it was the the cellist Daniel Levin, who you might oh, yeah. know. Yeah, he was at NEC, and he asked Alan Chase, who was the department chair, the jazz department chair, mm -hmm. if he could study with me. And I knew Alan from the scene in Boston, but not well. I had subbed for his ensemble a couple of times, and he told me at one point if he ever ever had had the chance to hire me, he would. But that was years. I had taught at Tufts at the Experimental College on the advice of Lewis Porter, who's a great musician and scholar, who I knew as a friend. And I did some stuff around Tufts University, but I wasn't attending Tufts. And he said, you should teach. There's an experimental open college. You should submit a, a syllabus and a course description and apply. And so they hired me. So I taught this course. And the syllabus for that course is essentially the outline for the book, The Properties of Free Music. So okay. that's how I was thinking. Yeah. And so I had kind of a reputation as somebody who could get, who had done a lot of stuff at the time. I already had quite a bit of records out. I'd been around the world and I got a lot of good press. And so Alan said to Daniel, yeah, you can study with him. And he called me up. He said, this is not going to change your life, but you can have one student every two weeks. And I said, okay. And I hung up, but I thought, this is going to change my life. <laughs> and, and so I got hired, and they put me on the faculty. And um, word spread that I could I could explain some of this stuff, and I started getting more students. And it took a few years. And then uh, after a couple of years, maybe two or three, two, I had a couple of ensembles. The, the first year I had ensembles, I had, I think, three ensembles. And I still have three ensembles. Mm. And my studio started building up, and then... Um, so it sort of just worked like that. It was like I had a reputation locally, at least. I was in Boston, so that helped. Yeah. Um, and uh, as somebody who could actually do this thing that wasn't being done there. They had, a, they had had one guy that they sort of let teach there, but they didn't pay, who was pretty controversial. And um, he was covering this sort of free improvisation way in, 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 in uh, 
I would say, a quite a different way than I, I did it. And so I think um, Alan saw it as a chance to um, give me a shot. Mm-hmm. And so I took it as like, you know, precious. I mean, I, my, <laughs> I, I take every moment in that place as like a precious, miraculous gift that here I am, I better do something with it. And, and um, um, the cool thing about it is that they let me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they let me. I mean, you know, people haven't asked me what I do. Like nobody on the faculty, no, no one's ever said, so what do you do, Joe? Like the students do. Yeah. I don't think they ask each other. You know, it's just this kind of consortium of like independent like, kind of planets that somehow impact the student body. Sure. And so that's how I got hired. You know, I was, I was invited to join the faculty 